Good morning.
region, unless you happen to be a gentleman with the name Matt. Hey, how's it going? Hey, uh, I need to actually plug in your microphone, so you're going to be you're going to be solo, uh, solo no microphone here in just a minute. But uh, hey, uh, just to let you guys know uh, who are joining us online, uh, the Reverend Todd Frederick. Uh, he is on administrative. Uh, he take, took an administrative week, and he is uh, not here. So we. On vacation. Yeah, it's on vacation. Yes, that's good. Uh, so we also have uh, Matt, who's helping us out. Uh, he's on loan from us from a. Uh, uh, Village Hope, right? All right, yes. I didn't say a different church that I wasn't supposed to. So uh, we're going to go ahead and have uh, Matt. He's going to come up here. Um, hey, let me go ahead and issue this. Thanks. All right, Matt. All right, thank you. Hey, do you want me to use that for a minute? Or? Oh, no, no, no. You, you should be good because uh, we're, we're on that microphone. Oh, and we'll, we'll get you tuned up for the rest of everybody else here. But uh, yeah, thanks again. Yeah, my love, pleasure. Love thank having you. you come out. <laughs> One moment, get myself situated here, maybe. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you guys, and um, it's good to be back again as well. I know uh, um, I've been able to, to, to fill on uh, on occasion here before, and so um, just want to say what a blessing it is to be here, um, and just just be able to share kind of what God's laid on my heart. Um, I want you to hear personally from from me to you, um, just how how much I, I treasure your pastor. He has been such a blessing to me. Um, he's, he's been helping me grow in my understanding of the scriptures, how, how to understand the Greek language, um, and just been such a mentor to someone who is coming into the ministry. I mean, there are days where I'm like, man, I wish, you know, I, I'm in my mid-30s, you'd think I'd have things figured out by now, and I know, that's that's cute, isn't it? It's like when I, 64, it's like when I tell my, tell people that we've been married for about five years, and I tell them, yeah, I've got marriage figured out, and I'm still remembering in five years, I'm a baby when it comes to marriage, and so um, he has just been such a blessing to me personally, and you you guys have a treasure in, in him and in Ruth Ann, and so um, I just want to publicly say how much I appreciate them. If you haven't had a chance to lately, just give them some love. I mean, it's, it's a blessing they can get away and um, have some time together with family, and so, but um, God, God uses him in wonderful ways in my life. I know he uses him in wonderful ways in the life of Pathway. And so um, I'm also here to say welcome um, from Village Hope. You know, it's, it's a blessing to know that we're part of one big church. You know, that, that God is at work um, here at Pathway. He's at work at Village Hope, and we get to do this together. You know, he has not called us as individual churches to say, okay, it's your job to reach all of Jackson. Yikes. But we can do it together. And so... I, I bring you greetings from them. We love you guys. We are for you. And, and we're excited to be co-laborers in the gospel together. And so, um, if, if I may, I, I'd love to open us in a word of prayer. And then we're going we're gonna to dive into 1 Timothy for a little bit today. So, Jesus, thank you again just for your love and for your mercy and for your goodness. And, um, Father, I pray that this morning is so true. I'm so grateful that every one of us woke up this morning to new mercies. Lord, that we... Um, are just recipients of grace upon grace, of mercy upon mercy. And God, I pray that um, you would help us, Lord, not to take that lightly. Sometimes it's easy for us to take your grace for granted, um, to act presumptively on it. And God, I pray that you would just help us to, to fall more in love with you, Lord, to see you better and better as you are, and to better be your hands and feet as you've called us to be. So Jesus, I pray that you would just equip us this morning in your word, Lord, that you would encourage us, that you would help us to to walk forward today um, having a little bit better understanding of who you are, Lord, a better understanding of what you're calling us to, and a greater love for you and for those around us. And so, Jesus, we love you, and we ask all this in your beautiful and your holy name, God. Amen. So, I have a prop with me this morning, if I can, if I can show it up here real quick. Um, you can feel free to shout out what this is, if you can see it on the camera and on here. What is this? It's a stained glass window, right? So this is actually the storm door from our church at Parma that came out at one point, and I needed a sermon prop, and so I asked Pastor Jeremy, can I borrow this? He goes, yeah, sure, go for it. So this is why I walk around with a stained glass, stained glass window this morning. But um, So our church at Village Hope in Parma, we have stained glass up in the windows, and that church has been around since like the mid-1800s. It's, it's got some years on it. 
And and in our church, the stained glass windows, they kind of tell the story of the church. Like they have pastors and wives who were there um, from the beginning. So you kind of get an appreciation of the history of, of the church that's right there. But let me just, let's make some observations, talk about the stained glass for a minute. Um, how many individual pieces do you think are in there? If you were to guess. Anyone want to count? Nobody wants to count? 367. 367. Someone said 350 out there earlier. It might, I have no clue. I didn't take the time to count it because I would fall asleep. Um, but there's a lot of individual pieces that are built into this. How many of them do you need to make the picture? You've got to have them all, don't you? If you don't have all of them, the picture is incomplete, right? And if you were just looking, like if we zoomed in on one of them, would you, would you necessarily know what it is? You'd be like, wow, that's a, something blue or something green or something whatever that color is. Okay. We might not see the individual pictures, but together they make something wonderful. Okay. They make something beautiful that, that's appealing to the eye. And so um, I want you to hold on to that thought this morning. We're going to come back to it um, towards the end of our time together. But it's a really good picture uh, of what God is doing with his church. And I'll come back to that thought. So just kind of lodge that away for a little bit, and, and we'll come back to it. So if you have your Bibles, if you could turn to the book of 1 Timothy for me. We're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 1. 12 to 17, and it's, it's kind of hard to pick up a note or a letter in the middle of the letter, isn't it? You know, sometimes when you get a letter from someone in the mail, which that does happen from time to time, I guess, still, you know, letters in the mail, um, when you get those, um, you don't start in the middle paragraph, do you? You usually kind of start at the beginning. So we're, we are going to pick this up in the middle, so I want to give a little bit of backstory to help us understand what's going on. So, so Paul is writing a personal letter to Timothy. He calls Timothy his, his true son in the faith. And so Timothy is evidently someone Paul led to Christ um, when he was on one of his missionary journeys. And on his journey at some point, Paul leaves Timothy at Ephesus. Okay? Ephesus is a big, booming city in the Roman culture. Um, if I remember correctly, it's a port city, if I remember. And there is just a ton of stuff that's going on in there. It's a big city. Um, it is characterized by idol worship. Um, there was a cult there called the, the Cult of Artemis that was there. Um, it was also a city that was characterized by the use of magic. And so the, the church gets planted, and you know what? The church gets planted in, in, in hard locations. It gets planted in areas of darkness because the light has to shine in the darkness. And so it's a good thing that a church gets planted in Ephesus. But, you know, just like us, any church can become susceptible to the culture that it's in. We can very quickly, those things can invade. And, and sometimes that line gets a little bit blurry where Jesus calls us to be in the world, but not of the world. Sometimes that line gets a little blurry at times. And so um, that's the setting of, of this letter. Um, when you look in the book of Acts, you can get a history of what was going on when the church gets established there. It's really crazy. If you go to Acts 19, you can see how just entrenched the culture was in the worship of Artemis. The gospel had taken such root in Acts 19 that it had actually wrecked the economy in, in, in Ephesus, which that doesn't sound like a good thing <laughs> on the surface, but their economy was largely built on the manufacture of idols. And, and the gospel had taken such root that people were throwing their idols away and they weren't going to people to buy them anymore. And so people who were making their money on idolatry couldn't make their money on it anymore. You talk about the power of the gospel, how it can change things. Imagine, just put that in, in, in perspective today in Jackson. Imagine the gospel takes such root that some of the sinful practices that we profit off of can't profit anymore. That's what was going on in Ephesus. And so when the gospel took root, people were starting to freak out because all of a sudden their, their supply run was gone. They didn't have any more money coming in. And so they start up a riot, and for hours they bring people into this huge area, and they're just chanting, great as Artemis of the Ephesians, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. It was a very, um, it was a tough situation. It was a situation God had put them in to be the light in the darkness, but that's not an easy situation to be in. And so um, as we pick it up in 1 Timothy, it, it seems as though Timothy wrote a letter to Paul first, and Paul's responding to him as to what's going on. And... Um, 
you know, Timothy has a big task ahead of himself. He's got to establish some order in this church. Okay, we've got to get back to making sure things are, are honoring to God so that the church can be the church as God intended her to be. Um, and that means for Timothy, who, by the way, is a young guy, he's probably my age, you know, he's going to confront some people, okay? He's going to confront some false teachers, probably some teachers that have been in that church longer than he has, okay? And so, I, I don't know if you've ever had that, that moment where you've had to speak up to someone who was older than you. That's horrifying, <laughs> you know? It's, it's tough to speak to someone your own age. It's tough to speak to sometimes to people younger than you, let alone someone who is older than you. They, they look at you and go, who do you think you are? And so this is where um, Timothy is getting this letter back from Paul because he's got some big tasks ahead of him. He's got to confront these false teachers. He's got to establish some order in the church so that she can flourish and be everything God wants her to be. And so Paul is writing this um, to give Tim Timothy the charge. He's also writing it to be an encouragement, to remind him of some things that are going to carry him through this. And so... Let me, let me dive into 1 Timothy 1. We're going to pick it up in verse 12, and we're going to go to 17. It says this. It says, um, Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And so um, it's interesting as you get into um, the study on this text, there are some people that would say Paul kind of hits the brakes and just kind of goes in a different direction. And, and the, many scholars say, no, that's not what's going on right now. This is a natural train of thought because he is starting to prepare Timothy for what lies ahead. And he starts off, and one of the things I want you to notice in the text is the verb usage. And as Paul is talking about this, he keeps referencing someone who is doing these things for Paul. What, what, what he's doing right here is saying, hey, God is the source of my ministry. Okay? When he starts off with Timothy, he says, God is the source. Jesus is the source of everything that is going on. He has been the source of my ministry. And guess what, Timothy? He's the source for you, too. For us today, guess what? He's the source for us, too. He is the one through whom all of this goes. And so I want to just kind of unpack what he has to say. And then we're going to get into Paul's story. Because as we get into Paul's story, we realize the weight that these words have in Paul's life and for Timothy. And so, um, as we as we consider the source, maybe you've heard that phrase before. You know, someone's talking to you, they're venting about a situation, and you go, "Hey, man, you got to consider the source." <laughs> usually, usually we're saying, "Think about who's saying it. Take it with a grain of salt." Right? Paul's kind of doing the same thing here, except when he says, "Consider the source," the source is Jesus. Remember who Jesus is as you walk into this, because that's what matters. So he starts off again, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, okay, who has given me. Who, who gave Paul strength? Jesus did, okay? He gave me strength. Jesus was Paul's source of strength. He was the one who allowed Paul to keep going. I mean, you talk about Paul's life. Paul was no, no stranger to persecution, okay? He goes through his rap sheet, I think it's First or Second Corinthians, all the things that have happened to him, you know, you hit one or two of those, most of us be like, you know what, I think I'm done. <laughs> and, and, and Paul's saying, no, Jesus is the source of my strength to do what God is calling us to do. That's why I keep getting up. My favorite story of Paul is one, one of the times he gets stoned and left for dead, they drag him out of the city and stone him. He gets back up and goes back into the city. That is the last place I would want to go in that moment. But he gets up and he goes back in. 
And so he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength. But he considered me trustworthy. Okay? Paul was, or sorry, Jesus was Paul's source of confidence to do what God called him to do. He was a source of confidence. He considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, okay? He was Paul's source of strength, of confidence, and authority. Who called Paul to be a minister? Jesus did. This is the call on my life. He has given me strength. He considers me trustworthy. He is the one who puts me in service, okay? Paul's, you know, and we'll keep on packing this. You go into, into verse 13. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy. Jesus was Paul's source for mercy. Okay. Because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Okay, verse 14. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me. Jesus was Paul's source of grace. Okay. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. It wasn't just a little bit of grace, it was lots of it. Praise God for that. The longer I walk with Jesus, the more I know how much of his grace I need. You know, the longer I walk with him, I realize, man, Lord, I am messed up. I have my own issues. Jesus was Paul's source of grace, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Okay, verse 15, you're a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. He was Paul's, Jesus was Paul's source for salvation. So this entire, this entire paragraph, this entire thought right here is a reminder to Timothy, Jesus is the source. Jesus was Paul's source for everything that Paul needed to be and to do what God called him to be and to do. And he's reminding Timothy as he is stepping into this situation, this tough situation, Timothy, Jesus is your source too. He has everything that you need to do what he's calling you to do. And what an encouragement for us, he's the same thing for us. Everything that God calls us to be and he calls us to do, he is the source for all of those things. Now put yourself in Timothy's shoes just for a minute. Again, young guy, he's got to confront people. How many of you love confrontation? Anyone just love to confront people? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, no. yeah, no one loves it. You know, some people love it a little too much. But let's be careful with that. Okay, but... None of us are like, you know what, I just want to step on someone's toes today. <laughs> you know, I just I just want to do that. None of us do. I really struggle with it. There are times that I know I need to confront someone in love, and I struggle to do it on a piece of bread. My, my, my mother's son. We're the same person in that regard. And so, if, if you're Timothy and you're listening to this, he's sitting there going, man, i got to do this, and I've got to do this. Oh my goodness, you know, if you, if you get into just briefly the second Timothy, one of the most famous verses that we read in the scriptures, God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, right? But of love, power, and a sound mind. Um, you, you can maybe pull from that. Maybe Timothy struggled with fear. You know, I struggle with that. I think all of us do. Fear can cripple us. And so, um, as you're, if you're Timothy, you're reading this, you're kind of going, man, look at what God has done for Paul. And can't God do the same thing for me? Isn't God the same for me? He is. And he can be the, the, the same for us as well. And that's really good news because if you're in here as a follower of Jesus, you've been called into the mission. You've been called. You know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Those are not commands given to like super spiritual people, which those people don't really exist. <laughs> They're normal people. That command was given to us, too. And if we're honest, none of us can say we love God all the way. Man, I struggle sometimes. You know, you know who I really love sometimes? I love me. <laughs> you know, I love me. I struggle to love God like that. You know, but as I lean into him, he helps me to do that. I really struggle some days to love my neighbor as I love myself. You know, again, it's really the reason Jesus says that, we all know how to love us. Nobody, when, when you're hungry, what do you do? You can get yourself some food. You love yourself and get some food. You know, when you're sleepy, you love yourself and you take a nap. Okay, loving your neighbor as yourself means the same graces and the same things that I would do for me. I'm gonna do for you too. I want to love you in that same way. Um, I'm not good at that. None of us naturally are. You know, we need Jesus to be our source to do those things. 
And then he goes on to talk about being disciples who make disciples. If you get into the end of Matthew, the Great Commission, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go therefore, preaching the gospel, making disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay. That command wasn't, again, given to a select few people. That command was given to every single disciple within your shop, which means it passes to us. And sometimes we think about the things that God calls us to do, and we go, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be, and really what it is, I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to do those things because, man, that's hard. It gets messy sometimes. It, it means that it means that I, I have to be willing to be inconvenienced in order for people you know, to come to know Christ or for me to love somebody else. And, and the answer to that is yes, it does. You know, you're not the source of your own strength, though. It doesn't depend on you. It depends on Jesus. And so Paul is calling Timothy back to Jesus to say, hey, just remember, consider the source of all of this. Okay. God has not called you to do something that he won't also equip you to do. Okay. He won't call you to do something that he won't empower you to do as well. He always does that. He equips us and he empowers us. And what he asks of us is faith. To take that next step. Okay, God, I know you want me to do this. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to take this step. Meet me in the middle of it. If I, if I take the step, will you meet me here to do what you're calling me to do? And so this message for Timothy, that Jesus is the source, it's timely for us to. We need to hear that. More and more, um, as, as we go, every day we get a little bit closer to the return of Jesus. You know, we, we look out at things going on in our world and we're like, man, things are just absolute bananas in the world. I, I don't know if you're, if you're like me, I read the news and I'm like, oh. Anyone else like that? Stop it. Yeah, I do that. Sometimes I gotta pull myself away from that. But I also have to remember that, you know, at the end of the day, Jesus wins. Mm-hmm. You know, he does win. And it helps me when I remember he's the source of my strength. It helps me to go, you know what? Yeah, things can be falling apart around me. It doesn't I'm going to step out and say, God, what do you want me to do? Because I can still share you with people. I can still love other people through your power. Um, I can still draw closer to you, and I can trust you to be for me what I can't be for myself. And so we see all of this encouragement to Timothy. And one of the things that I love is the words that Paul uses here, they weren't written in a vacuum. You know, Paul didn't just, and sometimes when we read the Bible, we think, Man, these are really nice words, but there's a lot of meat behind them. And not just meat theologically, there is meat theologically, but there's personal, there's personal weight to this as well. You know, if you get into Paul's backstory, which I'm sure Timothy knows at least a portion of it, not the whole thing, um, you start to understand the weight of what Paul was saying here. Okay. So if you know his backstory, um, the first time you're introduced to Paul, he was known by another name. His name was Saul of Tarsus, okay? Um, and so he was known as Saul. And the first time that you see Saul, Saul is giving approval to the death of a disciple named Stephen. Okay, Stephen speaks up and he, he calls the, the Pharisees, the, the Jews that are to the carpet, of you guys always resist the Holy Spirit. You know, he is trying <laughs> to draw you in. You won't have it. And they get angry and they take their clothes off and smacking them with rocks. And they take their clothes and they lay them at the feet of a man named Saul. And Saul was giving hearty approval to this. He was saying, yep, this man needs to die. That's Saul of Tarsus. And, and he believed in that moment he was serving God. Saul was like, um, he was the next up-and-comer in the Jewish circle. Like he was the, he calls himself in one book the Pharisee of Pharisees. <laughs> okay, or the, the Hebrew of Hebrews. He was, he was the next big thing in Judaism. And so he thought he was serving God. He thought he was doing what God wanted him to do. And so Saul makes it his priority to eradicate the way. So Saul then, <laughs> we, we see him give approval to the death of Stephen. Then he starts persecuting the church. Saul's hobby, well, his hobby, his mission was, I'm dragging you out of your home. I'm going to put you in jail or I'm going to see you killed. That's what Saul was doing to the people who were following Jesus. And then we get Acts chapter 9 when Jesus shows up and blinds him. And he goes, hey, Saul, why are you persecuting me? <laughs> and of course, Saul's like, uh, who are you? And he goes, I'm Jesus. 
who you persecuted. Get up and go. He takes him down into Damascus to a man named Ananias, and he, he tells Ananias coming in, hey, there's going to be a guy coming named Saul. I want you to, um, you know, to, to do your thing. I mean, I'm going to give you the strength to take away his blindness. Okay, God works and all that. And I'm appointing Saul to be the messenger of my grace to the Gentiles. And Ananias goes, um, Saul? <laughs> the, the guy that's, like, killing all of us? Like, are you sure? And God's like, yeah, I, I said what I said. <laughs> You know, and Saul goes from being this strict persecutor of the church to preaching and showing that Jesus was the Christ from the scriptures. Okay, you talk about a story, you know, and as you get into this with Timothy, as you go back through this text again, I think praise Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength. Okay, he has strengthened this ministry that he considered me trustworthy, that the guy that was killing people. He considered me trustworthy. Okay. Not because he was killing people, but because God had worked. <laughs> okay. He appointed me to his service. Okay. You, you, you keep going through all of this. You know, he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man. I was acting in ignorance and unbelief. I thought I was doing what God wanted. Okay. And then he goes out a little bit later and he calls himself here the chief of sinners. Okay. Or the, the worst among sinners. And it's like you, you start to get into the, the wording that, that, that is going on here with Paul. And it's almost like, man, if God can do this through me, Timothy, he can do this through anybody. If he can rescue me and he can empower me, he can rescue you, he can empower you. He already has rescued you, he's empowering you. The people that you're talking to that you need to confront, guess what? He can rescue them too. The people in Ephesus all around you, guess what? Rescue that too. What a story. What a story of God's grace. And so that the words weren't written to us in a vacuum. This story carried so much weight that when you get to verse 17, Paul's only response to this is to worship. Look at what God did to the king, excuse me, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. Be honored and glory. God, you're the one who did this. It wasn't me. I wasn't the awesome one saying, hey, God, you should put me on your team because I am awesome. Okay? God is the one who did the work. And he's saying again in Timothy, he can do the same thing through you. He's saying to us today, he can do the same thing through us. And so I want to spend some time talking about the importance of that story. Because here's the reality. If you're in here as a follower of Jesus, even if you're watching, you're not a follower of Jesus, all of us have a story. Okay, show of hands pretty quick. How many of you have a past? Everyone's got a past. 20 minutes ago was the past. We all have one, okay? We all have a past. We all have things that we have brought to the table here even this morning. And um, the, the reality is that God is a God of redemption. Okay, we read in the scriptures that he can bring beauty from ashes. Okay, he can, he can turn, he, he turns our sorrows into joy. And, and the story of God's grace in our life, it is such a powerful tool if we'll give it to him. Okay? It's a powerful tool in a couple of ways. The first way is being an encouragement or an example to other believers. Okay, again, Paul right here, um, for this very reason, in verse 16, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul's story was an example to people who would come to faith. Okay? It was an example to those who were in Christ going, hey, I messed up and I'm broken too. You know, one of the things that I find fascinating is if you read Paul's writings from like his earlier writings up to the Epistle of Timothy right now, which is towards the end of his life, here it's a little bit later in his life, as some scholars have looked at this, um, his view of himself changes. Okay? He starts off talking a little bit, not necessarily fondly, but you can tell that his former life had some weight to him at some point. By the time he gets to the end of his writings, he's going, I'm the chief of sinners. I need Jesus more and more every day. I understand how messed up I am, and I need his grace, and I need his mercy. And I need his strength to go. Sometimes we think the longer we walk with Jesus, the less we have to depend on him. No. The more we do. Because he keeps 
rooting around me here, showing what's going on, and saying, I've got work to do in here, and I want to help you become more and more like my son. And so the more we lean in, the more he exposes because he's good to us. And he's like, man, I, I want, you know, I want you to be free from sin. I want you to be free from its power. And so his story becomes an encouragement and an example to other believers. Um, one of the, my favorite things that I get to do in Village Hope, I, I love doing baptisms. Baptisms are fun. You know, and I, I don't know when, when, when they happen here, um, but at Village Hope, like we, give a, we have people give a testimony of what God has done. Um, I got to do my first one this last year um, with a high school senior. Um, we've been a believer for quite a while and decided it was time, like, yeah, I want to follow the Lord and, and in obedience and be baptized. And to hear his story of what God had done, it was such an encouragement. Um, I don't know about you, I, I, I love talking to other people who follow Jesus. I'm like, hey, what's God doing? And to hear what God is doing, like, it encourages me. Because I can get, it's easy to get discouraged sometimes. It's easy to just get, you know, we talk about the news, to get all doom and gloom and all that, and to forget God is at work still. He's at work in the people that are around you. He's also at work in you. The things that God is doing in you, it is to draw you closer to him, to make you more and more like Jesus. It's also something for you to be able to share with somebody else because you can be that same encouragement. Um, and so he's saying that, that the story, you know, Paul's story was an encouragement and an example to Timothy. By proxy, is an example to us. Why can't our stories be the same for somebody else? You know, all of us, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a story of God's grace in your own life. And you can use that to be an encouragement to somebody else, to help them go, um, and to grow in their relationship, to grow in taking steps of faith. Um, so your story can be an encouragement to somebody else who knows Christ. It's also a testimony to those around you who don't know Christ. Your story it's part of, it's just, it testifies to God's goodness. It testifies to his grace. Um, in the text here, Paul calls himself the chief of sinners. Okay. And again, it's that reminder that if God can save me, okay, he can save anybody. If God can use me, he can use anybody. And, you know, some people look at that and they're like, well, I've got some junk in my past that I don't know. I can't serve God. Can't do those things. Okay, does your past include killing other Christians? Nobody wants to confess to that this morning. No. Yeah, no. You don't have that in your background, right? You know, Paul does. Not that I'm recommending that. That's not a good thing. Okay. But Paul was even used by God in that context. Paul had a pretty, pretty dark past. Um, but God, being a redemptive God, can even use that to glorify Himself. When Paul first starts preaching, people start asking the questions at different times. Like, wasn't this the guy that was dragging us all off to jail? But like, what happened? What is going on right now? And so your story can be a testimony to the people around you who, who don't know Christ. Sometimes what we like to do, though, we, we, we look at our time, you know, we, we look at our past, we look at the times before we knew Christ, and there are some things in there that, yeah, we're ashamed of. There's things that we don't, even some of us, be honest, sometimes as believers, there are still things that we're ashamed of that we don't necessarily want other people to know. And I'm not saying that you, you always air all your, all your dirty laundry out to every single believer, but God can use those as he shows you grace in those areas and he helps you conquer those areas. He can use those pieces of your story as a testimony to the world that's around you. Which brings me back to this guy. Okay. We don't know how many pieces are in the stained glass window right here. There's lots. Are they all the same? No. They're different. And together, they make something that's wonderful. They make something that's beautiful. If I can take the church for a second and compare it to this, okay. everyone's got a story. Everyone has a story, if you're in Christ, of God's grace and his mercy, his strength, okay, his, his confidence. We have all of those things in our own lives. Okay. And collectively, they paint a bigger picture. Collectively, they testify to the goodness and the grace and the mercy 
of God. Each one of us has a story. I know that the book of Ephesians says that we're his handiwork. Okay, some translations say Ephesians 2 10, you're his masterpiece. Okay, what God has done in your life. That's a plural, though. It's not just me as an individual. As a church, we're a masterpiece of God's grace. And it shows off his goodness and his love and his mercy. And so what I want to encourage you with today, number one, Jesus is the source for your ministry. Number two, you didn't go through everything you've gone through by accident necessarily. Okay. Not that God is the cause of all things, all things good and all things bad. He doesn't do that, but he uses them. Okay. He uses them as we trust him. And so you have that story of God's grace and mercy in your own life not just for you personally, but to be a blessing to somebody else. And as you trust God and you step out and you talk about, this is how God's been gracious to me, this is how he's been merciful to me, you get to help build up the body. You also get to help reach other people with the gospel. And so it doesn't matter. So some people hear the, you know, the idea of a testimony or of, of stories of God's grace, and they're like, well, man, that story is awesome. My story is not that way. You know? Sometimes we look at the stories where someone has been like caught up in drugs or someone has been caught up in all these things in their life and they're like, man, that testimony is so cool. I don't have that testimony. Most of the people that have that testimony would tell you it's not a cool testimony. <laughs> nobody wants to go through that. And nobody wants that for anybody else. But it's God's grace in their life. The same God has the same grace in your life. And he can use your story to reach people with the gospel. And so let me let me um, just share part of mine with you today. I want to I want to illustrate this. This isn't me just talking about me for the sake of me, but this is what God has done. So um, I didn't become a follower of Jesus until I was almost 17. So I'm 34 now. I have lived as much of my life as a believer as I did as a non-believer, um, which is just kind of a unique place to be in right now. Um, grew up in a home that went to church sometimes. Um, we weren't quite like priesters or Christmas Easter Christians, um, we, but we were there, you know, every once in a while. And it wasn't something that I really loved. You know, I was the kid that was sitting in church, just being like, man, I can't wait to be out of here. I have other things to do that are more interesting to me. Um, and so church was a place you went to. It had nothing to do with the relationship with Jesus. Um, so I grew up kind of in that environment. And when I was 12, my dad left. And as a 12-year-old, what's going on? You know, I understood some of it, but it took me completely by surprise. It took my mom completely by surprise. And so we were, I was left with a pretty big hole in my life. As a 12-year-old, I didn't really understand. But as I got older, I realized the depths of that hole sometimes. And, you know, with that happening, it also was a source of anger. Why would my dad do that? Why would he want to do that? And it was something that just ate at me, you know. And there was anger, there was frustration, there was bitterness that was growing. Um, but a year later, I started to pick up some pretty heavy baggage, some different things in my own life um, that became pretty critical for the next few years. Um, and then when I was about I was about 16, I got invited by a friend of mine to come to the youth group over at Rise. I know like Pastor JP has been here a number of times. You've seen Pastor Dyke too. My friend invited me to go to their youth group. Our first event that I went to was a Tigers baseball game. There was no preaching. There was no anything like that. It was come to a game and, and meet my friends. And so I did. And then I started going to the youth group there. And then about a year later or so, I went to camp. And it was at camp when I finally understood at least in part, what the gospel was about. And I asked Jesus to forgive me and to save me. And what he did, man, the, the baggage that was there was gone. He took it, which is so stinky cool. He took it. He took that away. And then in time, he started to work on that relationship with my dad, which, you know, I came to a spot a few months later where I forgave him. You know, just forgiving him and understanding that forgiveness is an event as much as it is also a process. You know, because those things flare up from time to time. And I gotta go, no, I forgive him, and I do forgive him. And so, those, that's just a portion of what God's done in my life. You know, but that wasn't like you know, Jesus saved me, and then that story is done. Jesus is still at work. 
He is still helping you when it comes to overcoming things like fear. Okay? When it comes to um, you know, just different areas of weakness in my own life. Like that grace is still coming. He is still pointing things out to me. Not to be, you know, not because he's being mean, but because he loves me. He's like the doctor that knows you have something going on, and I love you enough to tell you the truth. And I love you enough to tell you some things that we do with whatever's going on. That's what God has been doing. And so this is what's so crazy awesome about this. As I've shared this story, I keep meeting people like you. So I was before I was a pastor, I was a teacher for a number of years. And the people that God kept sending my way were children from single parent, single parent homes. You know, walking through it's really funny. One of them actually, his his mom um, just Facebook friended me this morning. And he was one of my students for, for a number of years who went through the same thing I did. And you know, when you can sit there and say, hey, there's light at the end of that. I understand where you are. Let me tell you what God can do. It's amazing what God does. He keeps putting people in my direction that have walked with that same baggage, that have walked with a single family home. And it's amazing that as I share that story, God can work in the midst of all of it. And so, you know, in, in part right here, we have these commands to Timothy, this encouragement to him that Jesus is the source, and with that source comes the authority of Paul saying, this is what Jesus did for me. He can do it for you too. These aren't just words on a page. You've been a recipient of his grace. You've been a recipient of his mercy. You've been a recipient of his strength, just like I have. And you can pass that along to the people that you have to do some hard things with. Paul's goal, or Timothy's goal in confronting these false teachers at Ephesus, it wasn't just to say you're being bad. The whole point was we want you to come back. We want you to follow Jesus. That's the goal was reconciliation, trying to bring them back in, you know, saying if you persist in this, we can't have you right now. But I love you enough to tell you the truth that I want to call you to repent and to come back because I do love you even though it feels like in the moment I'm against you, it's because I care. And so, <clears throat> Paul's story, it's not just words on a page. It is, it is an example of what God can do as the source of his own ministry and for everything that he needs to do, what God calls us to do. So, let me ask us all today, what about us? You know, all of us probably have someone in our life that we can share this story. All of us have believers that maybe, man, what I'm going through, or what I've gone through, they're going through, and I can be a blessing to them. I can share with them what God has done in my own life, and I can be an encouragement to you, or to them. Um, all of us have people in here, in our own lives, who don't know Christ. If you're watching online, I'm sure you, if you're a Christian, you probably have people in your own life who don't know Christ. Your story can be a part of helping them come of giving them an example of God's grace in real life. And so when we when we get to those moments, though, you know, we, we all have those, those tinges of fear at different times. I don't want to share that. I want to just bury that. I want to I want to just put that so far away. You know, it's really awesome that you're doing this, Pastor Matt, right now. There's no way I can do it. It's not me. It's Jesus. He's the source of my strength, just like he can be the source for you. He's the source of my confidence. Just like he can be the source of yours, just like he was for Paul, just like he was for Timothy. You know, sometimes we say things like, you know, God does some awesome things, but I'm so ashamed. I can't do that. I can't talk about that. I can't drag that out. Okay, again, we're not trying to just drag sin out so that we can wake ourselves over the coals. That's not the point. The point is, this is God's grace in my life. This is what he's done when I turn to him. Okay? I have so much regret. Okay, consider your who's the source of your mercy? Who's the source of your grace? Okay, if you've given it over to God, is God ashamed of you right now? No, you're his kid. He loves you. He's for you. Okay, consider that source. If we're willing to trust God and engage in His mission, okay, He's gonna use your story to do some pretty amazing things. Okay, because of Him, He is the one that's at work. He's using you as the vessel to bring the message. That's one of the most amazing things about God, is everything he calls us to do, he 
doesn't need us to be led, but he wants to use us. He wants to. He delights when we say, yes, God, I want to do what you want me to do. Okay? And so he works in us and he works through us. Okay? To be honest, sometimes he works in spite of us. You know, he's still at work. And he's doing some amazing things. So, Jesus doesn't call us, I said this earlier, but I want to reemphasize it. He doesn't call us to things that he doesn't also empower us to do, that he doesn't equip us to do, and he doesn't endorse us to do. He does all of those things. He says, if you're my child, you're going to be a disciple maker. I've given you everything you need to do it. You have my stamp of approval to go and make disciples, and I'm going to give you the power, and I'm going to be with you. Very end of the Great Commission. Lo, I am with you always. Always. Not, I'm going to kind of be with you. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so, with that all said, I just want to encourage you, if you're here online, if you're here in person, um, if you got your phone, you can you can take some notes on a phone with this, or if you got some pen and paper, I just want to encourage you to do something with this today. I, I encourage you to write down two names. One name uh, of someone in your life that, that knows Christ and someone in your life who doesn't know Christ. And what I'd encourage you to do is to make it a priority. Maybe you know someone who's walking through something that you've gone through. Go be an encouragement to them. Go be a blessing to them. Go share that story of God's grace, what he's done in your own life. Maybe you know someone in here, and I, I would trust again, I think all of us do, someone who doesn't know Christ. Make it a priority in the next couple of weeks to share your story of what God's grace is done, what he did when you came to faith, what he's doing in your life, so that you can then share with them, hey, the same God that's shown me grace, and he's shown me mercy, he's shown me love, he wants to do the same thing for you. And he says, to trusting in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, in his death, burial, and resurrection, and forgive us of our sins and to save us, and to put us into a relationship with himself. So I'd encourage you, who is someone that you can share with that doesn't know Christ, and who is someone that you can share with who, who does? Because that story can be used to build people up to, and to bring encouragement, um, to give strength at different times. And so, um, that's what I've got this morning. You know, Jesus is the source of your ministry. He is the source of everything that you need to go and do and to be everything that he has called you to go to do. He's given, given us everything that we need, and all he requires of us is faith. Faith is what gives us the next step. God, I know you want me to do this. I have no clue how this is going to go, but I trust you. And so I'm going to take that step. And what God is honored by is our faithfulness. When we choose to step out in faith, he works. He works in us, and he'll work through us too. And so... I just want to encourage you with that this morning. And so thank you again very much for letting me be here, letting me share what the Lord's going to put on my heart. And um, it's going to be the church. You know, church doesn't end here. Church begins here. And then it goes through the week. And we get to be the hands and feet of Jesus, knowing that he's with us the entire way. So let me pray for us this morning. God, thank you again for your goodness. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. Father, thank you for your grace, for your mercy. Um, Jesus, thank you that you loved us enough that you came to die for us, Lord. Understanding full well um, the, the depths of our own depravity, the depths of our own sin, Lord, you still chose to come and to die. Um, and Jesus, thank you. Father, we can never say thank you enough for that grace. And, and Father, I pray that um, this morning, this is what an encouragement, Lord, that you have um, been able to work in um, in our hearts this morning to encourage us that you've given us everything that we need to be what you called us to be, to do what you called us to do. And so, God, I pray that you would just help us to be your hands and feet for the people that we um, uh, the people that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, our neighbors, the people that um, we share hobbies with, the people that we work with, Father. They're not there by accident. And Lord, that um, I pray that you would help us to be intentional, Lord, to build those relationships, to, to show love, and to take those opportunities um, as they present themselves, to share our story, to share about your goodness and your love and your mercy. So, God, I pray that you would just put that on our hearts, Lord, that you would um, 
put people on our minds to um, reach out to. I pray that you would just give us the, the strength to step forward, to take that next step, and the trust that you're going to meet us in the middle of it as we, as we lean into you and we rely on you. So, Jesus, we love you. Um, help us to be your hands and feet as we go from here. And um, we just give you the glory and the honor and all the praise as Paul did, because you're the one who deserves every ounce of it. And Jesus, we ask all this in your beautiful name. Amen. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Thank <laughs> you.